Okay, it's about time for us to get started. My name is Anna Hansen. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Association of Healthcare Emergency Preparedness Professionals AHEP, or April Educational Webinar. Because there are so many participants on today's call that are not currently members of AHEP, we wanted to review a few things before we began. First off, AHEP's annual conference has been scheduled for November 5th and 6th in Orlando, Florida, and we hope to get an opportunity to meet you in person there. If you or someone you know has a potential presentation topic, our presentation applications are open until April 15th, and that form can be found on our website. Secondly, as a member of AHEP, there are multiple benefits, many of which have been listed on these slides. As always, we will be following up on today's conversation with, through our Collaborate with Colleagues webinar on Tuesday, April 23rd. This is an interactive opportunity to discuss the topic at hand with your peers. These are very small group discussions that are only open to members. We also have a mentoring program where our less experienced members have an opportunity to learn from more experienced members and vice versa, as we know that we all have room to grow in our expertise. We would love to, for you to consider joining us in AHIP in the future. With that, we would like to move on to our presentation at hand. Please keep your microphone muted for the duration of the presentation. We will hold all questions until the end. If you have questions at the end, you may chat them and I will read them off as they come in. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, speaker, Dr. John Hick. Dr. Hick is a faculty emergency physician at Hennepin County Medical Center, HCMC, and a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Minnesota Medical School. He serves as the associate medical director for Hennepin County Emergency Medical Services and medical director for emergency preparedness at HCMC. He is also assistant medical director and vice chair of the Clinical Council for LifeLink 3. He served the Minnesota Department of Health as the medical director for the Office of Emergency Preparedness from 2002 to 2014 and currently works part-time for the U.S. Health and Human Services as an, as an advisor to the director of the Office of Emergency Management. He is an expert on hospital preparedness and crisis medical care issues and has published over 50 peer-reviewed papers dealing with hospital preparedness for contaminated casualties, disaster standards of care, and surge capacity. Dr. Hick also has strong interest in rotor wing and fixed wing medical care and worked in 1998 for the Royal Flying Doctor Service in rural Queensland, Australia, performing fixed wing retrievals across a large area of outback Australia from the Mount Isa base. He returned to Australia for six months in 2012 to work as a retrieval physician for the New South Wales Helicopter Service, performing rescue and interfacility responses. In his spare time, he practices disaster mitigation, response, and recovery at home with his two daughters, age 14 and 17. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Hick. I'll turn this over to you now. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I had no idea you were going to read that entire thing, or I would have given oh. you a warning about <laughs> too. Uh, so, <laughs> but thank you. So, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, we're going to give a very high-level overview of some radiation incidents today. And first, a couple of disclosures: I do work part-time for HHS Asper, uh, but I'm not representing their policies. Um, any opinions that I express is organized and presented by me. Uh, it's up to date as the time of presentation, but I don't take any personal liability for you applying this uh, after a nuclear detonation. So we'll go on to just talk a little bit about what I hope to cover. We're going to, again, take a 10,000 foot level. So uh, if you're hoping for an in-depth detailed explanation of uh, radiation penetrance and acute radiation syndrome and uh, the specifics of the EAST triage tool, uh, unfortunately, you're not going to get those today. What I'm hoping to convince you of is the importance of planning for these type of incidents at your facility uh, and then give you an idea of the spectrum of these type of incidents and how they differ significantly. You can't plan for a radiation incident uh, in the same way that you can't just plan for a biologic uh, terrorist incident or a um, you know, incident of bio anything when you've got a pandemic or an anthrax attack or smallpox, uh, they're quite different. So we're going to talk a little bit about reactor events, RDB events, and nuclear detonation events. I just want to point you in the direction of uh, Asper Tracy. Hopefully, a lot of you are already familiar with this. It's uh, aspertracy.hhs.gov. Uh, we've got a lot of topic collections uh, on different topics that are germane to the medical response to uh, disasters and healthcare preparedness. So if you're looking for additional information on radiation and nuclear uh, response, we've got a topic collection uh, just dedicated to that, uh, in addition to many, many others, whether it's uh, active shooter, uh, bomb and blast injury, 
um, hospital incident command, um, surge capacity, you, know, you name it, it's probably in there. If it's not, call the assistance center. Uh, and there's a peer-to-peer -peer information exchange also available uh, on the website for you to share information and plans that may not be available through other sources. Also for radiation, we remiss not to mention REM. Uh, REM is an amazing uh, portal that guides you to uh, many different resources for the medical management of uh, radiation emergencies. It is also downloadable so that if you do not have access uh, to the internet, you can still use it off of your uh, mobile device. And so that has its benefits. So we'll jump right in. Uh, radiation, just to get a few basic physics stuff out of the way with first, there's basically three different flavors to radiation. There's alpha particles, which are stopped by a sheet of paper, do not have a lot of penetrating power. Therefore, the only real danger with them is if you inhale or ingest them. Um, so inhaling dusts and things that are contaminated uh, would be the problem with alpha. Uh, beta will get through several meters, uh, several millimeters of aluminum, so it will penetrate uh, significantly into skin and can cause the so-called beta burns. Um, does release quite a bit of radioactivity, so it, it can be a significant danger as far as overall body radiation if you happen to be out in, say, uh, a fallout area. And then gamma is what, generally speaking, we're going to look at as the most dangerous of these uh, with the greatest degree of penetration. It's only stopped by a meter of concrete or lead. And so the usual lead aprons you would wear in the emergency department are really no use uh, at preventing you know, gamma or radiation. And irradiation is different than contamination. So gamma waves pass through you, uh, leaving no residual, but the damage is done, uh, and you've got to look for it. So there's one key difference we want to talk about right off the bat is that external exposure to radiation doesn't mean there's any contaminant left. So you could have uh, been exposed to life-threatening amounts of gamma radiation, and if you go over that person with a Geiger counter, there's nothing there. Um, and that may have been a local exposure from somebody handling something in a lab, a partial body exposure, or a whole body exposure uh, from, say, prompt or you know, fallout-type radiation. Contamination on the outside, um, conversely or correlately, doesn't mean that there's not also gamma waves that went through the person and caused irradiation injury. So the amount of contamination present is just the amount of contamination present. We gotta get rid of that, um, but we've also gotta think about is there a potential this person was significantly irradiated uh, and has you know, bone marrow and other organ injury from that. So external contamination, pretty easy to deal with, you know, wash and, and soap, uh, the usual things that you take care of on uh, your daily hygiene. Internal, big problem. And that's the thing we really, really want to keep this stuff out of wounds. Uh, we want to keep it from being inhaled. We want to keep it from being ingested. We want to keep it out of wounds that are currently clean. So uh, we want to try to protect those open wounds during decontamination processes so we don't get uh, any isotopes into those wounds that could then be um, inside the body and then would go on to be incorporated into body tissues where it's very difficult uh, to get those out. So our goal is to prevent the stuff from getting inside uh, that is residual contamination and then being taken up by the body tissues. Now the good news planning for a radiation incident is you already have a lot of building blocks in place. A lot of the decon principles are the same. A lot of the mass casualty incident protocols for trauma are the same for like a dirty bomb. A lot of the multi-agency coordination that you do between public health, emergency management, EMS, and hospitals is the same. Joint information system, SNS and pointer dispensing plans uh, can be adapted. And in fact, the CDC just recently published a really nice checklist that compares pointer dispensing plans to community reception centers for radiation. Uh, that's definitely worth taking a look at as well as your sheltering and evacuation plans. Bad news is that everybody's afraid of radiation. I, I kind of like radiation, I can quantify it, I can tell you exactly what it means to you, both from a short-term and a long-term uh, consequence standpoint in a way that I can't really with biologics and I can't really with hazmat uh, chemical incidents. So uh, radiation's got some benefits, but there's a lot of fear out there. Um, there's a lot of people that are gonna think they were exposed. There's not a lot of good uh, um, agreement, even between federal agencies sometimes, on thresholds for decontamination or thresholds for treatment. And I think most of us, if we you know, answer the question honestly, have probably not practiced these events in a very realistic way or in a way that is, is portable enough to allow us to really do a good job during a major event. So radiation detection and protection. Um, the detection of radiation can take place through a number of different means. There's a standard you know, Geiger counter here uh, with a standard pancake probe that does a really nice job with beta and gamma. 
um, not as much with alpha, but um, potentially the capability to do that, and a dosimeter um, to essentially measure as a speedometer the rate of exposure to a you know, public safety or a hospital worker that's providing decontamination or response activities. That's so important in making sure that your providers know that they're not being exposed to significant dose ranges and dose rates of radiation. Uh, and then on the far right is a frisker that's a very nice, easy to use um, detector that can be used to kind of sweep patients very quickly uh, with a minimum of equipment and fuss. So time, distance, and shielding are our friends. Uh, the less time that we're exposed to radiation at a farther distance and with whatever shielding is possible, including being inside structures, uh, that's a good thing. We'll come back to that a little bit later. I do want to emphasize the inverse square law of distance, that if you're a foot away from a radiation source and you're being exposed to 100 millirems per hour, if you double that distance and then double it again, so now you're only four feet away, you've reduced your dose rate from 100 millirems per hour to six millirems per hour. So this uh, inverse square law of decreasing um, by a square every time you double the distance away from the source makes a huge difference. And uh, obviously in a response, there's gonna be very limited areas that are going to have high ranges of radiation. Uh, move a little bit away and likely that radiation level is gonna drop pretty quickly. So the consequences of, of pure radiation exposure on the body are that the bone marrow is injured and stops producing blood cells. Uh, and the key thing here is that the white blood cells in circulation that fight your body's infections are still circulating. They're still gonna do their job for a while, but they're not being replaced. So early on, you're going to have some symptoms of the direct radiation on organs. It may cause some swelling and other things. And so in that first few days, there's gonna be nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, uh, during that time, we would love to make sure that we get any trauma or other stuff treated, uh, get people to the OR so that they are operated on while they still have a lot of white blood and give them cytokines to support their bone marrow producing the white blood cells. After that, though, those that are in the moderate injured category that don't progress to death you know, very quickly are going to go into a latent phase where they feel minimally symptomatic, no big deal. That's our window if we have a really big event to get them out of that affected area, especially after a nuclear event, and get them to definitive care. They may need antibiotics, they may need uh, some other support, but if we can move them during that time before they enter the late phase where their white blood cells are gone, the you know, bacteria in their gut start to get absorbed into the bloodstream, it causes infections and goes on to death, uh, that's a bad thing. So if we can get them in the latent phase, get them to definitive care uh, and the right resources, we can save a lot of lives. So the worse the radiation exposure, the more rapid those early symptoms progress. And so if you get a very high lethal range exposure, then you're going to go into neurologic symptoms, fever, lots of other things, and, and die pretty quickly from brain swelling and other causes. But this group that goes into latent phase is really, really important for us to, to capture. Remember that you're treating trauma. If trauma is present, you're treating that first, treating injuries first and worrying about the radiation second. That is different than we do for a chemical hazmat, where it's all about getting the contaminant off the body first. So with radiation, we can detect it. We want to try to prevent further contamination, and we don't want to be throwing the patient's clothes around all over the emergency department and things. But we want to treat that trauma first. Um, I would be very careful using vomiting as a sign of radiation exposure, and especially using it for prognosis, because people vomit for a lot of reasons. Um, 21st birthday, uh, psychological issues, you know, head trauma, um, GI infections, especially in the aftermath of larger disasters when they're in a shelter group. Uh, Vomiting is going to be pretty hard to tease out and say, absolutely, this is radiation related. And the benefit of giving those drugs that support the bone marrow is greatest when given early. So having some plans in a jurisdiction to get those drugs in and get them given to people that we think are in that moderately radiation injured group is going to be critical. And we've got lots of them in the system. Uh, it's a matter of knowing where to receive them, how to receive them, to get them out to people, to get them into people, and to track who has had them. And then fallout victims, um, those folks in the aftermath of a nuclear detonation we'll talk about later, that's really the key group that we're gonna save a ton of lives in because they don't have a lot of trauma. They're gonna be presenting later on uh, in the you know, progression of the event. There's gonna be a lot of trauma and burns early. Then we'll start to see the fallout casualties and then they'll most of them go into a latent phase and then have that delayed neutropenia and die. 
So one of the best things that we can do is make um, ALC depletion kinetics available, basically looking at what are your lymphocyte counts and how do those change over time after an exposure. If you've only got one uh, to benchmark off of, that's not as good as two or multiple. But making sure that if you're receiving city or you are a center with uh, the radiation injury treatment network or um, you think you might actually be you know, in an area of uh, nuclear power plant or other issues, how do you make ALCs available on a broader scale? How do your outpatient laboratories search up? Where can samples be collected? That's going to be really important because it's going to be your absolute best data source of knowing how badly these people had injured bone marrow. So let's talk about the different kinds of events that can occur. Transportation and lab events are uh, pretty rare. It's usually a known isotope. Uh, it's usually limited exposure. There's contamination issues. Um, rare to have uh, any acute radiation syndrome. Same thing with nuclear power plants. It's rare to have ARS unless you're an unlucky worker that happens to be very close to a source explosion or, or exposure. Um, in neither of these cases, nor in a dirty bomb, is there going to be fallout. Uh, we don't have to worry about that except in a nuclear detonation. And in a dirty bomb, it's really going to be more about taking care of the trauma and dealing with the nuisance of contamination from most of these sources. Uh, the radiation is not going to be the primary problem. And then the nuclear detonation, which we'll, we'll talk about in some detail. First, let's talk about power plant events. Every power plant has an emergency planning zone, or EPZ. And my hospital actually happens to be located down in the lower right-hand corner here in the EPZ for two of these plants. So uh, we're certainly familiar with their preparedness plans and what equipment they have and what plans are in place uh, if there is an incident at their facility. And they're required to do this by their public utilities, uh, or by their utility systems, and by um, the national program that governs them. They're responsible for having equipment and planning with the locals for reception centers and decontamination and any other consequence would result from an accident at their facility. So this is highly regulated, it's very well defined, and that equipment is generally owned by the utility, and unless specified, it's not usually available for public safety response. So if there's a dirty bomb that occurs, you can't assume that you can go and get that equipment from the utility and use it for response to a community incident. Um, that requires a little bit of negotiation. So these programs, generally speaking, are going to be equipped to set up reception centers with portal monitors, very orderly process for the residents uh, and transients through these areas to make sure that they get screened and decontaminated and get appropriate referral. Now the worst, by far the worst case scenario for a nuclear power plant is an incident that would you know, be similar to one that happened at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, and this was a, essentially a complete core meltdown. The uh, tsunami that came in unfortunately flooded the generators and took away their capacity to cool the reactors. Even though the core uh, immediately pulled its rods and shut down, there's residual heat. And without cooling water available to dissipate that heat, that heat by itself um, was enough to begin uh, the process of the core meltdown that led to the fires and explosions and the release of very significant radiation. So when we think about the shelters that were set up uh, after Fukushima and what is considered clean, a clean person showing up to one of these shelters would be 20,000 counts per minute on a Geiger counter or less. So you can imagine if you're listening to that in real time, that sounds like an awfully high rate of contamination, um, but it's really not in the general scheme of things. And so understanding the difference between dirty and clean um, is a relative thing after radiation. It really is more about radiation containment rather than complete control. I just want to show you um, some measurements, and these were actually captured by the Communist Party of Japan, which I don't uh, vouch for necessarily all their information, but this information actually was good information made available to the public. And take a look at the middle school in the center right of the um, picture there, and you can see some measurements that are in the range of one. And, and in that microsieverts per hour, what that actually is is 0.1 uh, rem per hour. Um, Sorry, we're getting, um, if somebody hasn't muted their line, I'm not sure what you're up to, but if you don't mind muting your lines, please, that would be wonderful. Um, and I'll, I'll try to do the same if my dog starts barking. But you can see the, that it's about 0.1 rem per hour. And so Fukushima Medical University in the lower left there, that is the trauma and medical center for that uh, essentially prefectures for that area. So 
you're asking providers to come into a range that is tenfold higher than normally we would have an exclusion zone around in order to practice medicine and take care of the population. And it's, a, it's still a safe thing to do from a relative standpoint. You can spend 50 hours in that area without getting up to uh, the threshold where we would want to have you cease activities. And inside of a medical complex with all the concrete and steel and everything around you, the exposure rates are going to be much, much lower. But you can imagine that a lot of times it's a communication issue. You have to communicate to your staff the relative risk. But you can see there's widespread um, you know, contamination that's occurring here. And that resulted actually for that middle school as well as the surrounding area and the removal of all of the topsoil um, down to six or more inches below uh, over the course of the next year. So these can be a massive environmental cleanup project. Uh, fortunately, don't tend to result uh, in many direct cases of acute radiation syndrome, um, which is a good thing, but a lot of issues from an environmental standpoint and the exclusion zones can be very, very prolonged after a true uh, core incident. So again, clean is going to be relative. So be prepared for having some, you know, quote, dirty sheltering uh, after a nuclear plant event. Radiation dispersion devices. How do we know that this bomb that went off in Boston is not a dirty bomb or has radioactive contaminants in it? And the answer is we don't know that until we assess. So for every blast that goes off, that isn't really clearly explained by a utility transformer or something else, there needs to be an assessment for radiation. But the focus is on trauma care. And I, I try to always enforce this with our hospital personnel is that I want you to worry about the trauma first and then break out the detection equipment when you're not doing life-saving activities. And we do have portal monitors mounted uh, in our doorways where the ambulance uh, would be entering into our critical care area, uh, as well as our decon room to detect any gamma that's being given off so that we do catch anything high level you know, pretty early on in the process and at least can focus on containment. Once the life safety issues are addressed, we can do decontamination um, and the, having a community reception center plan to do that so that not everybody is going to the hospital is really critical. Now, we need to have those operations in place and be able to ramp them up really quickly with emergency management and public health to sort those folks that actually were significantly exposed, to get them decontaminated, and then to conduct any internal uh, assessment that we need to through collection of specimens or other screening in order to determine any internal contamination and need for further therapy. And the risk communication for these is huge. It has to be done quickly, it has to be done right, and the people have to be directed to the right places. There's a lot of isotopes that can be used. You know, most of these have a mixed spectrum of uh, beta and gamma and some alpha. Um, not a lot of pure alpha emitters, although you know, radium-226 could be used. Cesium cobalt, we certainly see a lot in medical uses. The problem with cobalt is that it's a solid, and so there's a chance with that that it fragments and can actually send you know, highly radioactive fragments of, of metal out uh, you know, with a detonation of an explosive. Um, so that becomes a little more problematic than things like cesium, which tend to be a powder and get scattered to the point where, uh, and diluted essentially as they scatter to the point where there's not a very high concentration of radiation that winds up in or on a person. So if you miss a dirty bombs, the responders and victims are not likely to get radiation-related illness from these. Um, the higher the explosive, the more this stuff is dispersed. You'd have to have a really lot of product um, and a relatively small you know, explosive charge with some people being packed in pretty closely around it in order to get very high levels of exposure. The damage from these bombs is not any greater than a conventional you know, bomb would be. It's just that you've added some radioactive materials to it. There's no fallout. And the radiation isn't the main issue. It's environmental contamination and trauma. So some of the things we've done in our area is to make sure that we've got dosimeters on uh, every fire truck on the dash, uh, gamma detectors, and then we refurbished and recalibrated a bunch of the civil defense meters and got those on the hazmat trucks. So we can use those at the scene for a quick screening of people, um, qualitative screening to decide if they need on-site decon, which in Minnesota we can usually provide about two weeks out of the year in August. Um, otherwise, we're going to have to get them somewhere else and do dry decon and then send them through you know, a locker room or other shower system. We also purchase portal monitors for the major fire departments, uh, also for on-scene use and assessment. Uh, and then we engaged our state assets, our chemical assessment teams, the Department of Health, and our, our nuclear power plant programs uh, to figure out what equipment we had where, how quickly that could be mobilized, uh, and what the plan would be. 
So there's a lot of policy that goes into community level planning for these, you know, having your, your field responders have a quick reference card, uh, some overall plans and policy, uh, guidance for reception center or community response center operations. If you do have um, calcium or zinc uh, EDTA, that needs to have a distribution plan for it. Um, and the hospital decon and treatment algorithms need to be in place so that there's thresholds that you know you're going to decontaminate at, um, get those below, folks below threshold, and then do they need any further treatment or assessment uh, for internal contamination. We try to do a little bit of modeling for some specific isotopes that I'll talk about in a minute, and then making sure that, that everything that we did was as close to congruent with that done by the REP program, so that the same people that were trained in for the nuclear plant uh, activities, whether it was using the same portal monitors or a lot of the same process and policy replication, could be done by the same people. Um, and we had a lot of those folks register in our Medical Reserve Corps in a special Minnesota Radiation Emergency Volunteer section. So this is our field response card. Uh, what are your thresholds? What are your zones? You know, what are your first priorities? Uh, perimeters, fairly standard. Uh, the operating perimeter at 10 millirems per hour and sort of marking your outer perimeter at one millirem per hour. And again, you can spend uh, 500 hours in that zone. Uh, it's just, this is for the sake of extra caution, but having some baseline agreement and these are fairly standard numbers is a good place to start. As far as PPE goes, there's not really any specific PPE for radiation. It really is about contact and then inhalational injury. You do not want to be inhaling any dusts at the scene that have radioactive contaminants, nor be inhaling particulate that may be you know, mobilized off patients if you're taking their clothing off too aggressively at the hospital. So a respirator is ideal. A surgical mask is probably going to be sufficient because the particles aren't likely to be down in the three micron range uh, that we really worry about needing, you know, N95 or higher level of, of respiratory protection. So make sure that you're wearing uh, something that is either going to get tossed or cleaned, um, you know, after the fact because you don't want to uh, be absent usual contact precautions. So victim care again. This is this is in our you know area only. You may have different protocols. If they're injured, we just can trail their clothing. Uh, so essentially, dry decon, getting their clothing controlled into a, a trash bag, and then transporting them for trauma care. If they're not injured on home, uh, sorry, if they're not injured on scene, and they're not contaminated, then go home. Uh, if there is contamination, we've got some cards along with the uh, portal and other monitors. If you're less than 10,000 counts per minute, home with a decon card that tells you about showering and waiting for instructions about a community reception center. Uh, 10 to 25,000 dry decon, 25 to 100 wet decon if we can offer it. And then greater than 100,000, that's rare. Uh, that makes us concerned that there may be some embedded material. And in that case, we're going to refer that patient to a healthcare facility. At the healthcare facility or, or in the field from a threshold standpoint, greater than 1.1 millirem per hour or 300 counts per minute is usually our threshold for decon. We're aiming to get that person down to below two times background. Um, sometimes the threshold is higher than that depending on the circumstances, but that's kind of your initial goal is to do a soap and water wash. But do the life threat uh, assessment and the interventions first. Uh, and if you can, control the clothing and the linens. If you have the time and opportunity and there's an inhalational risk, try to get some uh, wet saline swabs like uh, you would for a throat culture or uh, even on long you know, Q-tip type swabs that you have uh, in an emergency department and do some nasal swabs and stick those in a bag with a patient label on it so you can come back later and assess those for inhalational risk. But if you're pretty busy with other things, don't worry about that too much. Hot fragments need to be extracted and put into a lead pig as soon as possible. Your nuclear medicine department, if you have one, should have these. Uh, if you don't, it's not the same thing as a pig made of lead. Uh, it's basically just a cylinder that's made of lead that you can put a fragment in that offers some shielding. Protect those wounds, uh, and if you have isolated wound contamination, you want to isolate those wounds with drapes, as shown here. Use a McGill forceps so you're not in direct contact with any radioactive materials, and use soaked Curlex swabs uh, and basically just swab that once, drop it in the bin, keep repeating that until you've decreased your counts to the point where you're comfortable that they have been sufficiently decontaminated. Again, this is just the hospital algorithms that we have. Uh, it's a double-sided sheet that just gives people an idea where to start. We really do encourage our uh, hospitals to use their nuclear medicine personnel um, as part of their response team to these events. Once the patient is decontaminated, then there's going to be a question about what treatment may need to be given if there is internal contamination. 
So what are the treatment thresholds for this? And, and again, this is the kind of information that at least your public health department and health physicists or others in the area should have some degree of agreement on is what's our threshold for treating these folks if they have internal contamination. A lot of these um, treatments are available either through federal sources uh, or state sources. So want to make sure uh, that you know where this stuff is coming from, on what timeline uh, for the various agents. And for some agents, there's no applicable you know, countermeasures, cobalt and iridium. Uh, you're kind of stuck with what you're stuck with. And just a quick comment specifically on alpha particle RDD, because if this is the only thing that this isotope emits, uh, you're going to have some trouble because they're really, really hard to detect. Uh, it doesn't penetrate into tech skin. You can't use your portal monitors. The GM probes are notoriously not great for alpha, and especially if they're covered, they, that will stop all alpha. So putting a glove or plastic bag over the probe uh, as a cover, uh, that won't work. So generally, we're going to go after facial areas and wounds, and we might have to do some internal assessments with urine and stool samples and other things to determine whether or not the person has contamination. Um, so that's the, going to be a big difference between handling a pure alpha event uh, versus a beta gamma. So the portal monitors are beta gamma only. Uh, the main thing I would mention about these is just make sure you got plenty of walk-off mats available so you don't contaminate the foot plate. Uh, once you do that, uh, this portal monitor is pretty well done. If you're planning your CRC, make sure you agree on the screening forms or process in advance. You can do this online, you can do this in forms. Uh, we basically took materials from the CDC and modified them for our jurisdiction. Uh, but you want to make sure that you're striking a balance between collecting all the information that you would ever want about the person uh, at the time and collecting the key things that you need to know about the person at the time they're at the CRC. So deciding about that balance and striking that balance is going to be important and you may have uh, a low Local approach to the form. What we found for gaps, and, and I'll just speak locally, but I, I think this probably applies to lots of jurisdictions, is that we don't have a lot of good field protocols and equipment for uh, screening for radiation and doing decon. There's not a lot of great acceptance of the fact that we're going to have to have some dirty shelters. Uh, nobody wants to volunteer their building for a dirty shelter. So just having a good discussion with emergency management about those concepts is, is important and having a good understanding of when they might be needed. Not knowing where your resources are, the time frame or the activation process, um, and that speaks some to communication and command issues with some of the agencies. Uh, not having good processes in place for internal contamination assessment, uh, either at the hospital with gamma camera or laboratory samples, uh, or managing those samples in large volume at a community reception center. You know, how do you manage potentially thousands of your analyses if that's what it comes down to to assess for alpha? And then just making sure that both public health and hospitals are ready for a larger event where there needs to be a lot of people that get screened. So the key thing here really is to get the, key, the stakeholders together. If emergency management and public health from the start don't agree on what their role is in a radiation event, you're gonna have trouble because if there isn't good agreement on a plan at that level, all the default minds are coming to the hospitals and that creates a gigantic problem uh, when you've got a lot of people that think they've been exposed and haven't uh, and you need the community processes in place to do that screening in a different location. So figuring out the shelter and decon issues, figuring out the assumptions and the thresholds uh, for care, uh, the CRC processes and plans, the equipment, uh, personnel education, and then making sure that you can get a hold of a good radiation safety officer or health physicist that knows the plans, knows the community, and can weigh in when something happens. All right, finally, let's talk a little bit about nuclear detonation events. So. Uh, we're going to use, and, and thanks to Brooke Bruttemeyer, a uh, colleague and, and friend of mine from uh, Lawrence Livermore for providing these slides. Some of you may have seen these before, which is wonderful. Um, I'm glad you have that level of awareness. But we'll walk through these just to illustrate you know, what is a potential for a single scenario here in New York City based on a 10 kiloton yield. Uh, detonated at ground level, so much less as far as flash and flash burns, much less as far as any potential for electromagnetic disruptions, um, and we're going to use an, an actual weather profile and day. So the severe damage zone that occurs after a 10 kT ground level detonation, and, and unfortunately there's not 
a linear relationship. If it was one KT, it would be one tenth of this. Is not the way it works. Um, anything that actually results in a successful nuclear detonation is going to be a really, really, really bad day for any community. But about for half mile, you're going to see major building damage or just essentially obliteration and a very, very high level of overpressure. Um, following that in, and then surrounding that is going to be a moderate damage zone that's going to extend out to about a mile where you're going to see significant structural damage. Uh, the interiors of the buildings are going to be severely damaged, um, overturned automobiles, collapsed buildings, fires. So think about that as a mile area where you're not going to successfully get vehicles out of, you're not going to successfully get vehicles into for some time. Um, you may need to use snow plows and other mechanisms to get those roads clear in a very rapid fashion to get uh, rescue units into this area because this is an area where the blast wave passed through, but there's not necessarily a lot of radiation in this area as opposed to the center severe damage zone where usually the level of radiation is very high. In the moderate damage zone, there may be a lot of rescuable moderately injured casualties. It's just a matter of getting to them because not only do you have the, the debris in that area, you've got glass breakage that extends out to three miles. And so with the amount of glass broken in the streets uh, and in that light damage area, some other structural stuff that may be in the streets, you're not gonna be able to get your ambulances and fire trucks through that without a lot of blown tires and a lot of issues. So the response to these kind of events is going to be really difficult um, in getting the right resources to the right place at the right time. And the biggest difference between this event and as far as like a bad explosion um, is going to be, and a bad radiation exposure, is going to be the fallout. So when a bomb detonates, especially at ground level, it's going to mobilize a lot of dirt, building materials, and other stuff that the cloud from the nuclear detonation is going to carry up into the high-level winds. So not ground-level winds, but the high-level winds. And those will get distributed then downwind and fall to the ground by gravity as fallout. And these particles can be intensely radioactive, um, certainly to the point of causing death for a lot of people that would be outside in this area. So as Brooke calls these purple ping pong balls of death, um, they're going to be drawn up into the cloud. Uh, there'll be dangerous radiation levels very close into the event. And then these will distribute themselves by upper level winds uh, over time here. So for the first couple hours, you can see the extent of the dangerous fallout zone. This is greater than 10 rads per hour. And our threshold for rescuers generally is five rads, uh, up to 25 rads for life-saving activities. So if you're outside, especially closer into this event, um, and don't have any protection, you're going to be in real trouble from an exposure standpoint. So in those areas, how many people are in the moderate light damage, dangerous fallout zone? Moderate damage zone, 250,000 people uh, in Manhattan with moderate injuries um, or, or other injuries that are going to need medical care. In the light damage zone, 150,000 people. And in the dangerous fallout zone, another 100,000 that are pretty much gonna be purely radiation injury and most of them at a level where they will be savable if we can get them to the right resources in the right time frame. So because of the access issues into the moderate damage zone, our best case for life saving is probably going to be in the light damage and those dangerous fallout casualties. So when we look at the overall numbers here, they're nasty, over a million people with injuries um, and a half million people in kind of the significant exposure and injury category. And some of those radiation injuries are going to be uh, latent. The person is going to have some minimal symptoms, and then they're going to progress over weeks. Um, if we don't recognize them and get them out of there in that period of time and get them medical care, we're going to be in trouble. But if we do, if we do provide a good job of screening those people and getting the medical care, we can save over 100,000 people. That payoff um, for that level of planning is really significant. So even though this is a low probability event, the consequences of not doing good planning for nuclear detonation, whether you're in the immediate at-risk area or you're in one of the peripheral states around New York or around LA or Chicago, um, it doesn't really matter where you are because you can be in Dodge, Kansas and people are going to be coming for you. And we'll, we'll mention that in a little bit. You're going to see a lot of people getting out of that area uh, and moving to areas where you're likely to be as healthcare providers and need to provide care for them. A couple things with fallout. Fallout releases more than half its energy in the first hour. 
And so the areas that are dangerously uh, radio, radioactive or, or have dangerous levels of radiation become much, much less so over time. So if you can get sheltered in that area, you're gonna be generally fine. Um, if you are a rescuer, realize that your boundaries and the levels of radiation, as far as your response goes, are going to dramatically change over time. So within the first 24 hours, you're gonna be able to get into areas very, very safely that you could not approach uh, early on in the event. So this kind of shelter makes a big difference. If you're in a one-story wood frame house, uh, you only have two to three times the level of protection uh, of outdoors. If you're in the basement on the right side of a multi-story office building, you're getting one two hundredth the level of exposure that you would if you were outside. So there's virtually no level of uh, radiation exposure that is going to cause you any significant consequence if you can get in the lower level or the deep interior uh, of a large building. So some of that means that we've got to do a really good job with upfront communication about sheltering. Uh, no question, that's a mission that, that public health and other entities uh, need to take on and, and do a good job with right away, because if we don't shelter people right away, we're going to have many, many, many more casualties. Um, so in this scenario, a million people could avoid significant exposure if they sought early adequate shelter. And every person is one less person that we don't have to care for in the medical uh, community on the medical side of the response. So sheltering is really a big thing as far as preventing uh, casualties that are otherwise going to burden the system. If you're interested in more in-depth information on nuclear detonations, there's a lot of really good planning resources out there. I'll draw your attention particularly to two. Uh, the Planning Guide for Response to Nuclear Detonation, the second edition in the upper left, is outstanding from a community level and consequence uh, and sort of threat analysis level uh, and a great place to start on the community level. If you're looking for something that's a little bit more focused uh, on healthcare, um, there is a document that came out from ASPER, a decision maker's guide that's done in the lower column um, that's excellent as far as covering more of the medical consequences. So triage after nuclear event uh, is going to be interesting. For the first part, we just need to think about standard trauma triage. So again, in the first 48 hours, it's gonna be about trauma care and hopefully getting a handle on what the radiation exposure level might have been to those folks based on where they were. Uh, and if we can get the absolute lymphocyte counts on them, that's great. There will be some burn casualties. The magnitude of those is really anybody's guess because ground level detonations don't behave the same way uh, as air bursts do. But there will be burn casualties and, and probably you know, many of them that will likely outstrip the regional resources. The overarching principle we want to always make sure to invoke is fairness. And we need to think about how we apply the resources that we have to the number of victims that we have. And we'll, we'll mention a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. But we wanna try to identify patients with uh, just trauma injury, trauma and radiation injury that has a much worse prognosis than either alone, and then those with just radiation injury. And as the volumes of these patients get larger and larger, if you're at a hospital that's very close to the scene of a nuclear you know, detonation, your bang for the buck is going to be to treat the moderately injured casualties first. So when DiCarlo and others looked at this with military and other models, the amount of time and treatment resources that you put into patients is better spent in an overwhelming situation by caring for those with moderate injuries, uh, rather than those that are so severely injured that they're one, less likely to survive, and two, are gonna consume a lot of resources and treatment um, time and also provider time and expertise. So just something to consider um, in a very overwhelming situation. And for those with radiation injury only, who are we really trying to go after to prioritize for care? And in those cases, we're really looking for that sort of sweet spot of the two to six gray uh, exposure range that across the board, we're gonna try to get those folks uh, the treatment resources. Obviously, in a conventional setting, we'll give everybody everything that we can. Uh, but when we get down to crisis care situations, it's that group that's in the two to six gray range that is going to benefit most from cytokines and antibiotics and other treatments that are pretty easy uh, and that are very likely to save their lives. 
I mentioned about the diaspora. This is just a picture of where um, Katrina's diaspora wound up. And so again, whether you're in Dodge, Kansas, New York City, uh, right in the area down near New Orleans, uh, you're going to see people moving away from mega disasters. And a nuclear detonation is going to be no exception for that. Every major hospital is going to see somebody come in uh, from that area that's going to need treatment and assessment. And fortunately, those treatments aren't always going to require aggressive interventions. In fact, there's a lot of folks that will just need risk stratification with a couple lymphocyte counts and then surveillance over time, and that's it. Um, there will be some that have pretty significant bone marrow injury but just need oral antibiotics uh, and some other treatment as outpatients and will do fine. Some of them will get pretty severe infections, be hospitalized, and wind up needing maybe intensive care, uh, potentially a, a small handful that would go on to stem cell transplant. Uh, but again, as the complications and the intensity of the treatment goes up, the number of these individuals goes down. So uh, we need to concentrate a lot of our planning on that risk stratification and surveillance and outpatient treatment. After nuclear detonation, there's going to be a lot of pressure on healthcare facilities as well as resources in that area. And so there have been some systems that have been you know, set up for this, uh, some more philosophical and operational, and then some of them uh, actually concrete systems of referral like the National Disaster uh, Medical System that moves patients from uh, areas affected to areas where there are adequate resources. The RTR, or uh, Radiation Triage and Response Model, uh, is basically just spontaneous triage points that occur. Uh, we can't do any blood work at those, but we do want to basically sort those folks. And if they're injured significantly, get them to a hospital. If they're not injured, but we've got concerns about exposure, they should go to an assembly center, where we can do some assessment of them and determine roughly, based on initial symptoms, at about 24 hours out, how are they doing? Do we think they're probably gonna wind up in that two to six gray range? And then from there, get them home, get them evacuated, get them to a hospital as needed. So these assembly centers are different from community reception centers. The community reception center is located in an area with adequate resources that is away from the detonation enough that they can take a structured approach and do a detailed assessment for both external contamination as well as any internal you know, residuals and do any necessary testing like lymphocyte counts. Um, but it requires a lot of resources and it requires a lot of time and process that you just will not have close in after nuclear detonation. So the assembly center is designed for a scarce resource environment, global assessment basically clinically of possible total body radiation exposure. It's a very quick screen to try to get the right people to evacuation and cytokine support resources as quickly as possible. So within 24 to 48 hours after detonation, a community planning for one of these events needs to be able to stand up assembly centers in both sites that are planned that you can direct people to or spontaneous. If there are metro stops or uh, other places that people have congregated, that may be a good place to set up an assembly center. But you're gonna need to process thousands and thousands of people per site, so this has gotta be quick. Your decontamination is not going to be technical, it's gonna be containment and just trying to keep that area reasonably clean. Uh, our main screen is just going to be, does the patient have symptoms of early ARS that's relatively mild, and is this a person that we can pretty quickly move along and evacuate them and get them countermeasures of care? So the EAST project um, was designed uh, as an exposure and symptom triage project to try to lend some structure to that sort of screening. Uh, we were joined by CDC and FEMA and other partners. We're assuming that, that ALC won't be available. If it is, it's probably a single uh, reading only. And this is only to be used in areas of very scarce resources like an assembly center. So again, we're sorting for that two to six gray uh, sweet spot exposure range where we get the maximum benefit for the minimal intervention. The next priority is greater than six grays. If we've got the resources, those folks are salvageable. They're just likely to require a lot more resources uh, in the process of their survival. And we do want to adjust for underlying illness or vulnerability. If you're a child, if you have you know, severe diabetes, if you're pregnant, uh, we want to take those things into account too. So this is the tool which has been published and is available on RAM as well as in the peer-reviewed literature. Now, if you have a single uh, single ALC that's available, that's great. Uh, you can use that and, and rely on that. 
Uh, the vomiting, both onset but also progression, uh, is very important. The IMAAC maps, the official uh, radiation maps from the interagency that are disseminated are really important in figuring out what area the person was in and what likely exposure to fallout especially they may have had. Um, other maps can be helpful too, you know, like the Communist Party or whatever you happen to have access to. And then less common symptoms with uh, the mild to moderate ARS, but possible diarrhea, headache, fever, um, skin burns, this helps at the bottom of the tool to categorize you for the highest priority, most benefit for countermeasures and referral to unlikely benefit. Now the limitations are we've never been able to validate this tool, obviously, and I hope never to validate it. Um, it's also not a binary, you're in or you're out tool. It's more of a risk matrix based on different symptoms, exposure level, those sorts of things. But at least it's better than an ad hoc decisions, an ad hoc analysis. So it provides a level of uh, consistency and fairness that we hope will bring some order to the assembly center chaos. Now, if you're at a community that is further away from the detonation, you should be, again, working just like you would for a uh, RDD, for a dirty bomb, and setting up a community reception center. Um, and the priorities there will differ depending on how far away and how many people you're going to be seeing. But this may be a place where you distribute countermeasures like cytokines for bone marrow support, or that may get done uh, at a different location. But again, that's the kind of planning that has to be uh, done and is a really good uh, checkoff to go through the POD to CRC guidance document that CR CDC has put out uh, to see where you already have resources, where you can link other resources, and what plans you need to make. If you're in a city that's part of the Radiation Injury Treatment Network, you may already be aware of what your role is within that. Um, that is, generally speaking, going to be uh, academic or other medical centers that provide a high level of bone marrow support for oncology patients. Um, at the same time, recognize that those jurisdictions that are in the written network are likely to get a lot of folks after a nuclear detonation by commercial and other aircraft that do not have need for hospitalization, but they will have need for monitoring the community by ALC and, and other indicators for the need to be in a hospital, in which case they're in the right place. Now, this doesn't exempt other metro areas from receiving evacuees, but it does mean um, that if you're in one of these jurisdictions, you need to be doubly prepared. So just a quick um, walkthrough about, you know, the bomb goes off, uh, key issues for emergency management, we recognize the incidents, sheltering instructions get communicated early, public works helps to support access for EMS and other entities, we get shelters open quickly, public information is a priority, family reunification is going to be difficult, um, but it's definitely an, an aim to achieve. Uh, and then getting the federal requests in and figuring out where to stage them is going to be important because there's going to be a ton of resources that can be brought to bear on this incident, but you got to figure out where to stage them and how to use them. And then working with public health to be able to get assembly centers open after folks have sheltered their 24 hours in the fallout zone, uh, we want to be able to direct them right to assembly centers to get assessed. And then all of the safety and law enforcement issues that may occur at these locations and for the general community. This is aftermath of 9-11, but it could just as easily be the aftermath in the moderate damage zone, a lot of particulate in the air, um, the right PPE, alternate transportation, uh, trying to get people to those RTR, those spontaneous sites where they can be triaged and, and gotten out of that area to either medical care or an assembly center. So for EMS, first thing, if you don't have detectors, you're just going to have to shelter uh, until you're instructed otherwise uh, and that you're not in an at-risk area or have a detector that you can determine whether or not you're safe to continue operations. Getting perimeters in place and, and knowing that those will change over time uh, is important. And just realize that for every um, seven hours that go by, that the radiation usually decreases to about a tenth uh, of what it was at the, uh, at the time that the blast actually went off. So a very rapid reduction usually in, in radiation over time. Establish some casualty collection points, those RTR points, make sure that your personnel are equipped with dosimeters, uh, and then just supplies for trauma care is going to be your, your one of your biggest challenges along with transport resources because there's going to be a lot of ambulances out of commission, blown tires, other things, um, getting the right resources and getting transport destinations identified.
And if you're a hospital that's an identified destination and you happen to be close in, uh, good luck. Here's your waiting room. Uh, here's your emergency department. It's going to be overwhelming. You're going to have to make do doing the best you can. The closer in you are to an event, the worse your situation is going to be from a resources standpoint. So if you are you know, hundreds of miles away, um, you're not going to see casualties from this event until days later. And sure, there's going to be a pretty good hit to your institution, but it's not going to be catastrophic. If you happen to be very close in, right away, you've got patients, you've got damage to the facility and may need to evacuate uh, with minimal resources to do that. Uh, and you're going to have a deluge of patients coming in over time that's going to be persistent and sustained. So the modeling suggests that for any hospital within uh, 100 miles um, and the closer in affected more, you could see in a major metro area 5,000 to 50,000 people presenting for evaluation. You can't obviously accommodate that. So knowing where you're going to shunt those folks to that are uh, uninjured or minimally injured and then kind of figuring out your continuity of operations and your prioritization process for triage, how you contain contamination within the facility because you're not going to keep it clean, but you want to contain that contamination and then deal with an overwhelming level of trauma care initially and then shifting to diagnosing ARS and trying to refer those patients on uh, through the evacuation system to get them out of the area is a good thing. And the public, if you're out and this stuff is falling and it's not snow as, as it is going to be later up here in Minneapolis, um, this is a problem. So you got to get yourself inside and get sheltered, uh, tune in to public information for instructions. And unfortunately, there's a large segment of the population that does not trust uh, what we have to say. So uh, trust and rumor control are going to be huge after these events because there will be a lot of conflicting information, uh, but getting the basic sheltering information, the basic referral information out there early as to what to do in after an event is going to be key. Getting those folks queued up at assembly centers for screening, uh, getting them the cytokines if they're in that two to six gray range so their bone marrow can be supported and they've got a better chance of surviving, uh, and then moving those patients to an evacuation site to get them onward move to an area that's got adequate resources to care for them. That's going to be our priority. So it's probably going to be by commercial air, by rail, by ground. On the public health side, uh, exposure modeling is going to be important. Um, screening and triage for those cytokines has to be coordinated with the federal uh, level as well as the local level. And then determining where the assembly centers are going to be and setting those up in coordination with emergency management, receiving the assets from SNS and distributing those, um, having a process for identification for evacuation, and then coordinating the evacuation with emergency management. And finally, not to underestimate the need for public health information, behavioral health support, and then creating a registry uh, at some point to be able to track the people that were exposed and treated. Receiving communities, I've mentioned, if you're a metro area especially, you're gonna have to have some formal and informal processes of receiving and screening and addressing the needs of these patients. Um, risk communication to the community that the evacuees absolutely do not pose a threat uh, to others is going to be important, uh, as is making sure that there is a registry established that's congruent with others uh, that are occurring around the nation. So that likely is going to be a federal registry that will get implemented uh, in real time. And then getting them referred to the right medical care or monitoring them in the outpatient environment. So in conclusion, it's a lot of information. We've covered a lot of ground this hour, but I do want to reassure you radiation is measurable. Uh, you can establish good risk correlation with health consequences, and therefore it's kind of good in that way. Um, we need to have a multidisciplinary approach to this. Uh, every stakeholder has a role to play, and they need to understand what the expectations and assumptions are around their role. High-level radiation exposure is really, really rare, and that's another thing we need to emphasize with all our providers as well as with the general public, um, is that that, aside from a nuclear detonation event, is going to be the exception rather than the rule. But the public perception is that radiation is so dangerous that any amount uh, is a problem, and we'll have to, to work hard to overcome that. I hope also I've convinced you that nuclear detonation planning is important regardless of where you are, uh, either because of direct effects or because of the diaspora, and that no disaster offers us as big an opportunity uh, on return for the planning that we do than a nuclear detonation event. So with that, I'm not sure that we have um, a lot of time for questions, but I'll do my best, and otherwise we'll get questions answered uh, indirectly by email and hopefully uh, archive those.
uh, along with the presentation from today. So please do take advantage of the Disaster Medicine and Public Health Preparedness uh, uh, journal that was issued that was devoted to medical and health consequences of a nuclear uh, disaster. That's open source. Uh, Rem uh, and Tracy, and thank you for joining us today and for your attention and hopefully your commitment to asking some questions and looking into some things at your facility. So thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Hick, for presenting today. Um, it does look like we have about two minutes. If someone has a question, you can type that into the chat box. It will be on the bottom of your screen in the middle. Okay, doesn't look like we have anyone typing any questions. So to respect everyone's time, we'll just close the meeting down now. If you do think of a question that you would like to send to Dr. Hick, you can send that to ahep at ahep.org. We will forward it on to him. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for attending this webinar, and thank you again, Dr. Hick, for presenting. Uh, a pleasure. The, Thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm. The May AHEP webinar will actually build on the information presented by Dr. Hick, and it will be presented by Kevin Arthur and Rebecca Hoffner. Um, from Intermountain Healthcare in Utah, and they will be speaking about their radiation injury treatment network that they developed. So we'll hope to see you next month, and everyone have a great day. I do see some questions about oh. whether the slide deck will be available. The presentation will be archived, but I, uh, yes. I can't make the slides directly available just because some of the images I don't have copyright uh, ownership on. So uh, thank you, but I hope that having the archived uh, presentation will be helpful to all of you. Yes, we will have the recorded presentation posted to our YouTube channel sometime in the next couple of days. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.